Hello, it's a pleasure to be welcoming you to our second virtual State of Democracy lecture for the year. I'm Grant Reher, director of the Campbell Public Affairs Institute, which coordinates the series. On behalf of Syracuse University, I would like to acknowledge with respect the Onondaga Nation, fire keepers of the Haudenosaunee, the indigenous people on whose ancestral lands Syracuse University now stands. Now, let me just take a minute to remind you that if you missed our first State of Democracy event, a conversation with Michael Atkinson, former US Inspector General of the Intelligence Community, you can find it on the Campbell Institute webpage under events. Before I offer a very brief introduction to this State of Democracy event, I wanna issue some heartfelt thanks. First of all, I wanna thank all of you for zooming in for this on what is a truly magnificent afternoon here in central New York. I wanna thank the Dean's office for supporting the series, especially during these difficult times. And Dean David Van Slyke is with us today and I wanna thank him for that as well. For technical support, I wanna thank the Information and Computing Technology Group, and in particular, Tom Fazio, who's engineering this event. Thanks as well to Kelly Coleman and Jackie Nachevsky, who work in the Campbell Institute and help put together these events throughout the year. So we've had the election and we're here today to look at what's it, what it's telling us so far about where we are politically and what some of the policy implications are. If you're watching the recorded video of this, I would like you to note that we are talking in the late afternoon of Friday, November 6th. Uh, this is a changing situation and probably some of the results will be different when, when you see this. But we've got four great experts here with us today, each of them with different specific backgrounds to help us parse this out. Regarding our format, we'll first engage in a conversation among the five of us, and we'll leave plenty of time then at the end for your questions. For the questions, you should be seeing a little Q&A icon at the bottom of your page. If it's not there, just move your mouse and it'll show up again. And you can type your questions in there. I'll be keeping them, uh, keeping an eye on them as we go. And a couple others are gonna be watching them too and will communicate questions to me. Uh, normally, this is the time when I would also invite you to the reception that we host following the event, the event but instead, I'm just gonna invite you to treat yourself to a drink and a snack when the event is over. So let me now briefly introduce our panelists and I'm, I'm just gonna give a line or two about them. I could fill the whole 90 minutes just listing all of their accomplishments. Uh, first, Jen Jackson is a professor in Maxwell's political science department. She specializes in black politics with a focus on group threat, gender and sexuality and social movements. Peggy Thompson is a professor in both political science and history, and she teaches a very popular course on the presidency every year. Len Berman holds the Volcker Chair in the Maxwell School, and he's a co-founder of the Tax Policy Center. He has a background both in DC and in academia. And finally, Jim Steinberg is a university professor of social science, international affairs, and law. He's a former deputy secretary of state, and a former deputy national security advisor and a former dean here at Maxwell. So I wanna thank the four of you for, for um, constituting the panel and making the time uh, to be with us here today. Let me just start with something really basic and, and, and Jim, I'll, I'll start with you if I can. Just what most struck you in these election results? What, what was one thing that really just hit you that, that you're gonna take with you? Uh, thanks, thanks for, for being part of this. Um, I think what struck me was how little had changed in the American electorate, um, that we had an extraordinarily close election in 2016 and an extraordinarily close election uh, the last time. Uh, I think one thing I hope especially our, our younger listeners and, and participants will pay attention to is it really shows that, that votes matter because votes have made a big difference, but that Despite four years of President Trump, we haven't seen a significant shift in attitudes. So, several demographics have moved a little one way or the other, but broadly, we see, I think, a lot of stability um, in, in the situation in the country, which has some challenges for governing, and I'm sure we'll have a chance to talk about that in the course of uh, this afternoon. 
It does it does really seem like people were dug in and, and sort of in the same trenches and not moving very much. Jen, what about you? What most struck you? So it's actually interesting. I have to echo Jim's comments. I think um, what struck me was actually not a result of the the ballots that were cast or the or the vote counts that came back. It was actually the fact that folks were surprised about the outcomes. Um, I, I I was on Twitter and I saw a lot of people who were surprised that um, actually more white women, uh, based on the exit polls, uh, seemed to have voted for Trump. Um, but the fact of the matter is that white women tend to vote Republican, and only twice in the past, you know, 50 or so years have they voted Democrat. So it's actually not a surprise that they voted that way, but what's more surprising is that people were surprised by it. <laughs> so um, I think my surprise has been the kind of um, reactions that I've seen among so many people uh, when a lot of us who, especially those of us who study race, gender, class, and other intersections thereof, we've kind of expected these outcomes. I wonder if that in some ways is, is the tendency or perhaps the over tendency to look at these things through the lens of identity politics only and not think of other things. But um, Len, same question to you. What, what most struck you? You got to unmute yourself, Len. <laughs> That's a okay. rookie, mis rookie mistake with Zoom. That's all right. <laughs> I want to go before Jen on the next round because my answer is the fact that so many people seem surprised. <laughs> I, I, you know, it's a great example of confirmation bias that, you know, we all evaluate evidence in a way that's consistent with our worldview, uh, and, you know, I mean, one thing that surprised seemed to surprise people was that the election wasn't resolved on Tuesday night. And I think all the Democrats thought there'd be a landslide for Biden and the Democrats would take the Senate and they'd you know, get more get more gains in the House. And all the Trump followers thought, you know, they love Trump. So everybody else must love Trump, too. And the people in the media warned us that there was a good chance that we wouldn't know anything the night of the election. And actually, I think when when you were setting up this conference, uh, I think we, we all probably said, you know, there's a good chance we're not going to know who won the election when we held this panel. But still, I mean, I was surprised. I thought, yeah, of course, everybody's going to see the world the way I do. But it was pretty predictable. Well, I have something I was surprised. About. I want to get Peggy to come in on this. And maybe I'll come back with my surprise and see what the four of you think about that. But Peggy, what most struck you? Well, I'm terribly annoyed that I'm the fourth one because everybody's taken all the good reactions. Um, I think what surprised me was that despite the fact that we were prepared for the red mirage, that we were prepared for not knowing anything on Tuesday night, that we were prepared for all kinds of things, we all got tremendously upset wherever we happened to stand on the election and the candidates. And um, I think that there's still a sense of, of urgency about knowing the results rather than about knowing that the results are achieved correctly. Well, I, I want to leave plenty of time to start thinking about the policy implications. And let me just say my understanding here at 410 on Friday is that one independent organization has called the presidential race for Joe Biden. He certainly looks like he's got the inside lane on this as the day has progressed, but that is the only organization so far that I know of. But here's the thing that I'm surprised, and Peggy, so that you don't end up going last, you go first on this one. Uh, but I, I was surprised at how well the Republicans did. I mean, this was a very good night for them. And if we just take a step back and we think about this and, and you know, forget about the polls for a minute, but you, know, you had a president that was impeached, um, he's been at the uh, uh, either the center of or the cause of multiple scandals over the last four years. Protests of one kind or another have become commonplace in this country. Uh, and he demonstrated what was, I think, at best problematic national leadership uh, on the fight against COVID, which is, you know, the great challenge here in this in this era politically. So so why did they do so well, do you think, Peggy? I think our nation is really polarized. And if we think otherwise, uh, we've really been misled by I don't know what. There's been no indication that the nation isn't polarized. Um, this election reflected that. And one of the lessons that it's, I think, reminded all of us of 
about is that although Donald Trump may not be president of the United States after January 20th, the phenomenon or the phenomena that produced him and the reasons that his voters support him so strongly are not going to go away. And so we need to think about how the nation is going to respond to this polarization. And we're seeing polarization within each political party, I think. Is the future Republican party the party of Trump or the party of something else? Is the party, is the, are the Democrats the party of the progressive wing of the party or the party of the centrists? And so there are a lot of unanswered questions even after we have an answer to the question of the election. Well, we had we had so many Republicans in Senate and House races, and and even uh, state level races here in New York, mm -hmm. outperform the president. And, and so, I sort of took the the Republican success as saying something perhaps about the Republican brand absent Trump, rather than being a, a statement of you know Trump's stamp on the party. Um, Jim, do you have any thoughts yeah. on that? Absolutely. I mean, I, and I, I, I've been talking about this a bit with other, you know, political scientists. I, I think that what we're seeing is a repudiation of Trump, right? We're seeing a rejection of Trump and the ways that he has handled the presidency, but not necessarily a repudiation of uh, Republicanism, right? I think there are still a lot of people who very much so believe in the fundamental ethos and ethics that underlie the Republican Party, who believe that uh, being Republican is central to their identity, that it is an organizing feature of their, their worldview. And so for those folks, being Republican still really, really matters, and voting for Republican folks down ballot still really matters. Um, but they they also are thinking I, I don't want to vote for Biden, right? So there's a question of how do they how do they make this decision, right? How do they make the decision to um, either not vote at all um, for the president um, and still vote down ballot? How to make the decision to vote for Trump and hold their nose, which a lot of folks did on both sides, um, Democrats did it as well, um, or do they just kind of you know? go with the flow. And I think that's what everyone has had to talk to themselves and with their communities about this election. How do we engage in the process of electoral politics knowing that there's not an ideal candidate on either side? Um, and so that's why we see down ballot both on the Democratic side and the Republican side, not a lot of really surprising shifts. Um, for the most part, things are relatively even. And that, in, at least from what I'm hearing, that's the reason why. And Jim Steinberg, you, you wanted to jump in on this one. What, what, what thoughts do you have about this question of Trump versus Republican brand more generally? Yeah, I mean, I actually think that what was striking was that although we hear reports about a lot of Republican down ballot candidates being nervous about being associated with Trump, almost none of them disassociated themselves from Trump. And so, you know, they may have done a little better than he did, but it's not because they said, well, I'm different. I mean, with the exception of right here in Syracuse with John Katko, it's hard to find many Republican candidates who, who wanted any distance between themselves. So I think for sure, and I think Peggy said this, is that this really cements Trumpism in the Republican party because there was, there was nobody paid a price for, no Republican paid a price for being associated with Trump and no Republican felt that that was the way they needed to go to secure their victory. So I think if anybody thought that somehow there was going to be a reversion to Republicans of the Romney-McCain persuasion, there's nothing that I see here that would suggest that any Republican candidate would see that as part of their future. I was expressing that view on uh, some talk shows uh, the last couple of days. Maybe, maybe I'm just optimistic in that way. I don't know. but. Uh, uh, I want to squeeze one more question in before we start thinking about policy implications here. But um, I want to pick up exactly, uh, Jim, where you left off. And Len, Len Berman, your thoughts on this, but what kind of candidate then would you imagine the Republicans coalescing around uh, four years from now, uh, assuming, let's just say, that Joe Biden does win like it looks like he's going to? You've got to unmute yourself. There you go. Uh, I might leave that question about the candidate in four years to my political science colleagues, but I do have a comment about the 
about why the Republican congressional candidates did so well. And I think it was because people thought that Biden was going to win. And that even if people didn't like Trump, that he did a pretty good job of demonizing Biden and the Democrats who were going to manipulate him into doing scary things. And I think, you know, the reason the Democrats did so well in 2018 was that voters voted for a break on Trump. And the reason that the Democrats did less well in 2020 was because they also weren't sure they wanted to give free reign to Biden. Two theories that, that I've heard sort of dovetail of that is one is just as you said, 2018, the punishment down in, in the midterms was to Trump by proxy. He was on the ballot this time, so you could not vote for him, but then vote for a Republican at the, at the Senate or, or House level. And another one was the desire on the exactly what you said, the assumption that Biden would win uh, to create some balance, that there is some evidence that voters want divided government. They think it creates some kind of effective. Um, let me just get, um, uh, Peggy, let me get, get you on this and, 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 then, and then maybe we'll go on and think about some policy implications here. Unless Jen, you wanna jump in on it too, but go ahead, Peggy. You have to unmute yourself. I'm gonna start saying- I certainly do. <laughs> I'm gonna leave it unmuted and be quiet. Okay. Um, but if you're talking about the question on who the Republicans will run mm -hmm. in four years, I think this suggests a really short honeymoon for Joe Biden. Uh, you know, he hasn't even been inaugurated and we're thinking about who's gonna run against him. But clearly that is an important question. And I think there is going to be a battle in the Republican party between the Trump wing and the, if you wanna call it as you did before, the Romney, Ryan, McCain wing of the Republican party. Um, and I, I don't know how it's gonna turn out. And one of the advantages of being a historian is we look at the past and we don't predict the future. But um, I think that that is going to be the debate that we see within the Republican party over the next four years. And it will be reflected in whatever the nominating contest is in the Republican party. And Jen, did you, Jen Jackson, do you wanna jump in on this? I mean, I, I think for me, um... Thinking about the <laughs> thinking about the Republican Party is something I don't spend a lot of time doing. I'm not gonna lie. Um, it, most of the young people I talk to are not concerned about Republicanism or um, what's the future of the of the Republican Party. Um, but what I will say is that um, as as we talk about this, what I've been thinking about in terms of who uh, turned out, and I'm looking at the questions also in the in the Q and A chat. Um, and the fact that there that, that turnout was so was so high in this election, um, and that 70 million people uh, voted for Trump, and I, that's not lost on me. Um, and and I don't think we're talking about that enough. Um, and the fact that that 70 million people were not just voting for a Republican candidate; they were voting for a Republican candidate who has oversaw the deaths of over 200,000 people um, due to COVID who has refused to wear a mask at um, his own events and exposed folks to COVID-19, who has um, called uh, different racial groups names, slurs that I won't you know, repeat, who has been accused of all sorts of sexual misconduct and still um, 70 million people voted for that candidate. And so I, 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 I want to, yes, talk about the Republican party, but I also want to be very careful to disentangle um, what those 70 million people voted for uh, from what we think of as uh, Republican Party traditions and, and what that means writ large for the Republican, Republicanism we knew before <laughs> 2016. Yeah, I was, I was struck by the fact that Trump got about a third of the Hispanic vote. Uh, it really was, really was quite striking. Well, all right, so let's, let's start thinking about what the policy implications are and the political implications are for this going forward. And again, you know, we're, we're kind of working with the working assumption that uh, Joe Biden will be the president. And uh, we, we, we got a couple questions, um, Jim Steinberg, about um, how this will affect foreign policy in different ways. And you're obviously one of the best people on the planet to ask this question to. So um, one question was, 
how will this affect our standing internationally? That you know, the standing of the country did did take a hit uh, internationally in the last four years, and so will that recover? How quickly will it recover? What kinds of things would be necessary for that? Well, let me just start with that one, and then there's another question about foreign policy that I want to put to you. And and if any of the other three of you wanna wanna jump in on foreign policy, you know, just put your hand up, and I can I can include you in there. So, Jim, go ahead. Yeah, so thanks, Grant. So I, I, I mean, I think it, one is going to overgeneralize. I mean, there are important other countries uh, that had a more positive view of President Trump. And I don't think we want to lose sight of that. For example, if you think about the attitudes in India towards President Trump, quite favorable. And there are, there are parts of Central and Eastern Europe that had very favorable views of President Trump. And so, you know, we say, well, American standing went down and now we'll come back up again. It, it went down in many important places for sure, um, but it was more mixed, I think, than the commentary often suggests uh, in terms of how people felt about it. That having been said, I think that um, certainly among sort of traditional allies, uh, there's a, a, a sense of relief and a sense that things will get back to more traditional sense of positive engagement. And that will happen very quickly. I mean, Biden is an extremely well-known quantity. You could imagine somebody who had more foreign policy experience, better known both to foreign policy elites and publics abroad. And so that gives a great deal of reassurance, I think, to America's traditional friends abroad um, that the kinds of things that have been hallmarks of American foreign policy, strong relations with like-minded allies are going to continue. And it will happen very quickly. That will be welcome. You can be sure in places like Germany and France and and um, and uh, Japan and others it, that that will certainly be felt, um, and there's not Biden doesn't have to do a lot uh, to get that goodwill back because he is so well known. Do you think, though, Jim, just to follow up, that there will be pressure on on a President Biden to take some uh, actions against certain countries? I'm thinking of Russia, for example, um, given the criticism that the Democrats have made about the way that. You know, Donald Trump has has uh, uh, his relationship with 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 uh, Vladimir Putin, um, and perhaps I'm thinking also maybe of Iran, uh, maybe something in Korea. Will there be pressures on Biden to kind of grab swords, or I don't know what other mechanisms might be used? I don't think a lot. I mean, there there are a couple of areas of foreign policy where there will be pressures on Biden, uh, which he will welcome. I mean, the most obvious is going to be on climate in Paris. Um, with the, the, the coincidence of the U.S. withdrawal having coming at the same week of the presidential election. Uh, and, and there's going to be a very strong sentiment among many countries to, for the United States to re-engage there. And I, you know, everything we've heard from Biden suggests that he's going to do that. Um, but, you know, it's interesting on Russia, notwithstanding the, the sort of the, the, the love fest between Putin and Trump, actually U.S. policy has not been very favorable towards Russia. Mm. Congress has made sure that that would happen. So it's not as if there are policies that need to be changed. Um, and so, you know, that, I mean, that's the irony of, of this is the places where, you know, there's been concern. Um, the Congress has actually had, has been a break on a lot of things that the president might otherwise have wanted to do. So in terms of specific pressures for him to, to do things, I don't, I don't see a lot of very specific things out there other than, so certainly not Iran is going to be a complicated question because again, I mean, Biden was involved with the, the negotiation of the, the agreement with Iran. One imagines that if you look at the people who are close advisors to Biden, they were all involved in the negotiations with Iran. And so you could be confident that something's going to happen different uh, on that front, but how that will take place, I think the specifics still remain to be seen. And Peggy Thompson, you spent a lot of time studying presidents over time and particularly, you know, their foreign policy as well. So do you have any hunches about how foreign policy or international affairs regarding the president might change? Well, I think Jim makes a really important point that Biden has already been involved in this. He's already well known to so many um, international leaders. Um, there is going to be a little disentangling of some of the things that have happened over the last four years, I believe. And I think it's going to be really interesting to see, for me personally, who Biden appoints to his foreign policy team. Will it be um, 
Obama redux, you know, will we see Susan Rice in an important position? Who are the people going to be who um, Biden surrounds himself with? Will there be a Biden doctrine or a Biden policy that we're going to see? What are his priorities going to be? Um, and I, I'm really, really curious to see who some of his appointees will be in the area of national security and um, global affairs. Well, one of them might be sitting with us on the panel, who knows? Well, there is that, I didn't want to say that. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> let, me, let me turn to uh, two domestic policy experts here, Jen Jackson and Len Berman, uh, in, and pose this question about domestic policy. And again, you know, we're assuming that, uh, that Joe Biden does ultimately win the presidency. That seems like a pretty, pretty good bet at this point. Also a pretty good bet that uh, there won't be a, a democratically controlled Senate, at least not one that doesn't, re doesn't have some really conservative uh, Democrats there, two from Georgia uh, in, the, in the mix. So, so it's going to be uh, not a Congress that's just gonna go along with everything. It's, there, there is the Senate, not just the House of Representatives that majority is solid. So given that situation, uh, Jen Jackson, what do you, what would you expect to see changing on the domestic policy front? So, so this is a really tough question because there's like the expect to see changing and then the hope to see changing. And those are very, very different. Right? Well, let's do expect, let's do, <laughs> okay. let's, let's deal with the reality. <laughs> um, so I, I definitely think that in terms of expectations, um, because of, of Biden and Harris's experiences, um, both um, both of them coming from positions where they've dealt directly with, like for instance, crime legislation, uh, surveillance, thinking about Harris's long uh, history dealing with truancy laws and everything in California, they're gonna have to address uh, criminalization and some type of reform when it comes to policing in the US. Um, they both uh, have talked very, um, uh, eloquently about what they intend to do about policing, especially as it pertains to young Black folks. Um, and I, I expect that they will take that on immediately, probably within the first 90 days. Um, I'm also thinking that since they've talked so much about immigration policy, um, and since it's been such a hallmark of the kind of failures of the Trump administration, that that is um, an area that they will want to address immediately, specifically thinking about, you know, the uh, children who are currently in cages at the border um, and, you know, the news that says that they have been kind of separated from their parents and we don't know actually where their parents are and who belongs with whom. Um, so I think those are in terms of policy and agenda items that they'll take up immediately. Um, I think those will be issues that they have to, to focus on. Um, but I, I do want to add um, in terms of the hopefulness uh, it's connected, right? So these are actually things I do hope they'll take up as well, um, but I hope they'll take them up in such a way that they are accountable to the communities that actually have worked so hard to elect them, right? Um, these are issues that are deeply rooted in black, brown, uh, queer, poor, working class communities. The ones in uh, the metropoles of Wisconsin, uh, Georgia, Philly area, you know, these are places where these are the folks who elected them. <laughs> these are the folks who were in those counties um, that went for them eight to one. And so they're accountable to these communities and I would hope that they take that seriously. So my expectation is that they will respond to those voters who have organized those votes for them. There's, a, there's a, a, a brief set of statistics in the exit polls that I wanna look at in a couple minutes, Jen, but it, it ties in directly with the point you're making. Let me ask this follow-up question though now, and that is, can you imagine then some kind of specific policies that, that might be able to gather a broad enough coalition to be enacted into law? Yeah, I mean, I think the thing is that um, while I am an abolitionist, right? And so defunding the police is something I'm very, I'm very, um, uh, strongly behind, I don't think that that is the policy that they'll take up. 
Um, what I do think is that they are going to take up reformist reforms immediately. So they will, um, and as far as what I've seen, um, and I'm thinking about some of the work that some other political sciences have done, um, I think Jonathan Mumolo works, Jonathan Mumolo's work, Ariel White's work, um, Hannah Walker's work, um, that talks about the ways that we have to get first buy-in <laughs> on any policy around criminalization and, and defunding police. So policy-wise, I'm expecting um, that there will be some form of nationwide push toward, uh, you know, the typical reform. So, you know, body cam standards, um, training, uh, you know, bias, implicit bias um, training, things like that, that although they are not um, proven to be totally effective to reduce um, the impacts of policing on vulnerable communities, they are uh, at least seen as ways to reduce the escalation of police contact. And so uh, again, as an abolitionist, I would love to see a conversation around defunding um, and around um, community policing options. But I think that those are the type of policies they'll take up when it comes to policing. And I wanna to turn to Len Berman in a moment here to think about some of the other kinds of domestic policy implications here. But first, uh, Peggy Thompson, you, you wanted to jump in on this point. Well, I just wanna say, I agree with pretty much everything that Jen has said and about the importance of those issues. But I think the first issue that, that a Biden administration is going to have to take up is some kind of responsible and comprehensive and scientifically grounded response to the coronavirus. Um, and I think that would be true of anybody who were elected at this time other than Donald Trump. And the other thing that's connected with that is frankly, um, more comprehensive consideration of healthcare reforms and comprehensive provision of healthcare. Uh, both candidates have talked about that. They have different, but in some ways compatible ideas. And so I would simply add to the priorities that Jen suggested um, the issue of healthcare and also, I think, um, employment. So that's a segue, I think, for the unmuted Len Berman to jump in. And I was on top of the mute button, Lynn, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm not sure there's so much common ground on healthcare, but the, yeah. the, 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 the thing that has to happen is we've got real crises. You mentioned the pandemic. Uh, you mentioned, you know, if the Affordable Care Act is overturned by the Supreme Court, 20 million people could lose their health insurance coverage in the middle of a pandemic. And I, I think, uh, uh, you know, it's been, I can't, can't remember who it was who said it, Rahm Emanuel who said, never let a good crisis go to, go to waste. Yeah. But the crisis will force policymakers, or at least I hope it will force policymakers to act. If we don't, if we don't pass a significant economic stimulus, the economy could sink into a depression. The economy's done, part of the problem we've had so far is that the, the first round of economic stimulus was remarkable. And it was so big that it actually worked. And because it worked, uh, some policymakers were saying, well, we shouldn't spend any more money. We should just let it go. But it's, you know, <laughs> there, there are a lot, of, a lot of businesses that have closed, a lot of people that have lost their jobs. And this is a crisis like one we've not seen in a hundred years. Uh, so the policymakers have to do something about economic stimulus. They have to, they have to do something about dealing with the pan, pa pandemic in a more effective way. Although that's obviously a really fraught issue because uh, we've got a bunch of people who don't think that science is actually dispositive on this subject uh, and have to do something about healthcare. And we also have looming long-term problems that actually aren't that long-term like climate. Uh, I had, I, I did have criminal justice on my list, but I figured Jen and, and Peggy, Peggy took care of that. Uh, infrastructure, you know, Donald Trump has had infrastructure week every week for the last four years without actually any legislation or any movement. Uh, and there could be a compromise on immigration. It seemed like the easy thing would be DACA. I mean, these are American kids who have skills that are useful. Uh, you know, the real question is whether Nancy Pelosi and Mitch McConnell decide that, that decide that they want to work together. And unfortunately, the you know last last four years plus 
makes you wonder whether both parties would want to sign on, but the the alternative would just be disastrous. Well, on 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 that note, I want to turn to Jim Steinberg, and because Jim is the one that first said originally how struck you were by how polarized the country is, and I'm hearing a lot from Jen and Len. It seems to suggest the possibility of things actually getting done in the next four years and the, 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 the possibility of people coming together around some specific things. But the other thought is you could have four years of just gridlock. Uh, we've already seen a pretty in, in, intransigent um, uh, Republican majority in the Senate. They didn't seem to pay a price for that particularly. So, uh, and, and, and you also were, were there for Obamacare. So, so what are your thoughts on the future here in those terms? Yeah, I, I got to say, and I'm sorry to say it, that I that that sounds like the triumph of hope over experience. You know, there. I mean, the, the closeness of this election, the success of the Republican congressional candidates had the fact that Biden is the age that he is, um, which raises lots of questions about whether there's a second Biden term. Um, I wish I thought that Mitch McConnell and his colleagues would have a change of heart and come together, but. I can't see any reason why they would at this point. I think they, they see a great opportunity. They see a tremendous close election with all the liabilities, personal liabilities that Trump had and saying, well, they look at 2024 and they, they, it's got to look awfully attractive for Republican candidates and, and why they would give any ground or make it easier or, or you know make the political fortunes of the Biden administration easy. I just don't see. I can't see why that would happen. I mean, having lived through this in divided government in the Clinton administration, and then with uh, Obama, you know, there, we have very little sense that, that opposition parties now see that they need to put, you know, country before party. Uh, and so I, I can see very few, I do think on the stimulus, there may be something that can be done, because I think that although there are different views about this, that that's, there are reasons to want to get it done. But on most of the items that we've talked about here, I, I wish I saw a common ground. I got, healthcare seems to me to be absolutely a dead end, uh, even though, you know, functionally, as you say, there are compelling cases for doing it. Lens made the case, but why? I mean, and, and if you believe, and I think colleagues here have made a good case, that what the American people voted for was divided government, it's going to re even further reinforce Republican leadership view that that they that they're supposed to put a break on Biden. So I think the issue for Biden is going to be very similar to the issue for Obama, which is how much do you govern by executive order? How much do you decide that the only way to go forward is through the things that you can do by yourself? And some of the areas it's quite clear. I, I think it'll be high on Biden's agenda, like the environment, where there are all these executive actions that, that Trump has taken, which Biden can easily reverse. I mean, they'll, they'll be challenged in court, but at least there were executive actions, but on the congressional front, I, I regret to say I'm very pessimistic. That's kind of my view is as well. Um, Len Berman, you had your hand up while Jim was speaking. What did you want to add to that? I just figured my role is to play Dr. Pangloss on this panel, but uh, yeah, actually my, my notes actually said that I didn't know how these things were gonna work out. The thing that sometimes, you know, the triumph of hope over experience we have two senators who, at least at times, I mean, Joe Biden has done a lot of bipartisan work in the Senate, and he's actually been criticized by people on the left of the Democratic Party for being too bipartisan. Uh, and Kamala Harris has worked with people on the other side, too. At least they know how the Senate works. Uh, you know, at least in a rational world, do you think Mitch McConnell would welcome having a president who behaves in a way that they can understand, makes commitments that they can follow through on, actually wants to talk to people in the Senate about what happens rather than make unilateral tweets as policy. Uh, I'm not gonna bet my house on that outcome, but there's a chance. Yeah, so there, there's one question that that has that came in early and, and I wanna put it to the group here. So we're gonna shift gears just a little bit, but this is, this is it's a very important one. And, and I think it's kind of been hanging over some of the things you've been talking about with gridlock, polarization, and other things. And this is from this is from Doug Holbrook. Um, and basically, the the essence of it is the the electoral system itself has come under such attack. 
and is now seen by so many people as suspect, whether that's the mail voting piece or early voting or even just the counting of the votes. Um, won't there, there, there must, it, would there be enough momentum then to use this moment, again, going back to Len, your, your quote of, you know, never waste a crisis uh, from Rahm Emanuel, for some kind of fundamental reforms to our electoral system, maybe something to make it more integrated than 50 separate elections happening on the same day. Um, is there, is there a, a space and a need uh, and room to, to do something there? Could Biden use the, the, all of the controversies surrounding his own election for, for that? Um, uh, Peggy Thompson, do you do you have, have some thoughts about that? Maybe I'm being pangloss now, or Doug Holbrook is. Well, I think that people have been focusing a lot of their energy on the Electoral College, and I think that that is a very long shot and a very slow shot, especially since the number of states that would need to approve such a constitutional amendment uh, would include a lot of the states that would lose the most by any kind of reform. But I do think that one possibility is, is perhaps more states going with the Maine and Nebraska model of proportional uh, allocation of electoral votes, which doesn't require a constitutional amendment. And uh, I think that's more likely. Um, I do think that what this election has shown us is that there is um, a hunger for more ways to vote People took advantage of voting by mail. People took advantage of early voting. Um, we have the largest turnout we've ever had. A lot of those voters are new voters, first time voters. And so I do think that the methods of voting are going to continue to be expanded. I think there's a big constituency for that. And I think it's bipartisan. Um, I don't put a whole lot of faith on uh, abolition of the Electoral College because of how, you know, what that would involve. Yeah, that, that would seem a bridge too far, but right. and Jackson, do you, do you see hope for some version of a new and perhaps more extensive Help America Vote Act coming out of the Biden administration? So, so a Help America Vote Act, I could see something like that. But yeah, I, I think I've seen a lot of folks, on, you know, talking about getting rid of the Electoral College. And I, I think that that's a lot, it's a heavy lift for, um, as we talked about already, Biden, who is 78 years old um, and has a lot to take care of. Um, I also think that something I want to foreground here is that, you know, Kamala Harris is, is not 78, is quite young um, and is, uh, I would say, positioning herself to run for president in four years, right? Um, and so I think that that is a, a very possible outcome of a long-term plan for Kamala Harris. And in addition to something in line with um, helping to rebuild some of the losses that came from the dismantling of pieces of the 1965 Voting Rights Act as well, right? So I think that there absolutely will be some work here um, over the next few years to actively combat voter suppression and actively um, rebuild confidence in the American electoral process. But I don't think that that is, you know, mutually inclusive with anything that has to do with changing the electoral college um, inherently. And what I want to do also is, is highlight what Peggy just said about the fact that this is the highest voter turnout that we've had during a global pandemic when people have been relegated mostly to their homes. Um, and been forced to stand in these lines all over the country. Uh, and folks have been using the mail-in ballot procedure even after the sitting president said, you know, don't mail in your ballots. <laughs> People still mailed their ballots in. Um, it was nearly a hundred million ballots that were mailed in. I think it was a few days. People were, were telling how many ballots had been tracked and it was over a hundred million or so. Um, and, it's, and that is really, really impressive. And so I kind of want to also focus on the fact that even though there was some anxiety about uh, the electoral process, people still participated and still took it very seriously. So I do think that while there are ways that we can actively combat voter suppression over the next few years and over the next you know, two terms of whomever ends up being president, um, I, I don't think that people are inherently, um, have inherently lost all their confidence in how the system works. And that's why we've seen folks working so hard to make sure that their vote was counted. I think one of the 
you know, when there's a postmortem about this election and assuming it comes out the way it looks right now, I think one thing that the Republicans will probably be thinking about is whether it's a good idea to uh, discourage their old voters from voting by mail. Because, you know, it's possible the election outcome could have been different if uh, their demographic had found it easier easier to vote. So I think finding finding a way that both both sides are comfortable with with uh, for voting by mail would be a good outcome for the country. And there is the potential for bipartisan support. I'm a little bit. I mean, I I'm a little bit skeptical about Mitch McConnell jumping in on the Voting Rights Act, but that might be something for 2023. <laughs> Jim Steinberg is shaking his head when you said that. Uh, Jim, weigh in on that briefly. The problem is that, that you know, one of the things that didn't change that, that people worry about the blue wave was state legislatures and state houses, right? And so this is still Republican dominated and I don't see why the Republicans in Washington would undercut the Republicans in the state houses and the state legislatures. So um, we have a mess it's a, just an awful mess right? with you know, the confusion, the diversity of the systems, the inequality between states and the way states do it. But I don't, I, don't, I, I don't see the political calculus that would lead the Senate in any event to want to change what is a, at least now going to be an advantage them going into redistricting right and the, with the, after the census. So another real barrier, I think. Again, I don't want to be the, 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 the downer in this conversation, but I just see a lot of reasons why all these things, which aspirationally many of us would like to see happen are likely to happen. So I have been um, integrating uh, to some extent the, the questions that we've been getting from the audience into some of the questions that I've been putting to you. We'll turn exclusively uh, to those questions here in a minute, but I did want to return to this one factoid in the exit polling that I think uh, touches upon some of the points that Jen Jackson was making. And, and I just wonder whether it has an implication for things that um, Joe Biden or the Democrats or the Republicans for that matter might wanna be thinking about in terms of policy positions going forward. And maybe the four of you will just, after I, after I relate these numbers, you could just sort of shrug your shoulders and say, so what, there's nothing interesting there. But I thought this was um, very striking. And in fact, I didn't believe it at first when I looked at it. But I'm looking at the New York Times exit polling, and it's usually that that is usually pretty accurate. And what I saw when I looked at the vote breakdown for the president by income level of a household um, just surprised the heck out of me. And it's this: that when you look at households with annual income under $30,000 a year. So we're talking about households that are really struggling. And then you look at households with incomes under $50,000 a year, okay? The sort of the core of what Biden was appealing to. And then you look at households with incomes under $100,000 a year. In each of those groups, the breakdown is exactly the same, exactly the same. That is 42 points for Trump or 42% percentage 42% for Trump, 57% for Biden, that there was no movement whatsoever when you went from a household with an income under $30,000 as one group to all the households under $100,000. Now, when you get above that, you, you saw differences. But I thought that was striking, and it was striking in contrast to the following other exit poll factoid, that when you looked at uh, the, the, the choice on how uh, much of a problem is racism in this country right now. For those who said that racism was the most pressing problem for the United States, the breakdown was 11 percentage points went to Trump and 87 went to Biden. When racism was a, an important problem, among other important problems, it went to 35, 63. And then as racism was perceived to be even less of a problem than that, then the numbers really shift. So you're seeing a quite a bit of movement on, based on the question of how you view race and hardly any movement when it comes to economics. I just saw that as perhaps something that the Democratic Party might wanna take a look at and think more carefully about their messaging about class 
as opposed to their messaging about identity. I don't know if any of the four of you are struck by those numbers or have an easy explanation to them, but they just, they surprised the heck out of me. Jen's laughing, so she's gonna have to comment on this. Jen Jackson, go ahead. Why is this so funny? I mean, I, okay, so the reason why I'm chuckling is because, you know, I've been obviously digging into these numbers a lot this week and thinking about um, how kind of terrible the Democratic Party has been in mobilizing voters, especially around issues like what you're pointing out, right? Um, Trump actually did a really great job, and I hate saying that sentence, but I'm going to say it, um, a really great job mobilizing specific groups of Latinx voters um, because he was able to tap into that very thing you just pointed out, right? The fact that there are very specific divides and biases and ideas uh, that people have about one another um, that animate their political beliefs and ideas about how the world should work. And where a lot of uh, democratic surrogates uh, fail to, to acknowledge that those uh, type of organizing features are so central to the political process, that's where they end up failing to mobilize folks. So um, in places like California, there are um, very large uh, Asian populations and Latinx populations that were not mobilized well by Democrats in, in California, which is is, you know, it's California. So they're like, oh, it's blue, it's fine. Um, but also those folks have, you know, relatives, friends and family connected to them in Texas, <laughs> in Arizona, in Nevada, <laughs> right? Um, and so it's part of this larger conversation that I think we need to have about the ways that um, race, class, gender, all of these things intersect with one another in important, in important ways. And when we fixate on one marker of identity um, and correlate that with something, for instance, I, when you say income, a lot of people think about education level, but they don't think about the fact that um, people take with them a whole host of identity markers that shape their political beliefs and ideas. And so the reason why I'm chuckling, um, and I don't mean to chuckle, but I'm chuckling because uh, the variation around race is because Trump has been really effective at mobilizing people around the, the central organizing features of a lot of their identity markers. And one of those being race. And, and you know, he's also been able to mobilize folks around class. He's been able to mobilize people around gender. And we might not like some of the ways he's been able to mobilize people. We might not agree with some of the ways he's been able to mobilize people, but he's been able to mobilize them because he's tapped in to the fact that they are even within groups, especially within groups. Um, for instance, you know, Latinx folks, again, not a monolith. Black people, not a monolith. We saw that more Black men in this election voted for Trump than in the last election, right? Um, we know that Asian Americans, again, not a monolith. And so he's able to tap into these, these features of folks' identity in ways that we, we I think, sometimes don't fully acknowledge. Um, and it's, it's, it's sad, I would say, because we have to keep having this conversation each election where we're like, wow, I had no idea um, that people were so different, even within groups. And it's like, yeah, yeah, we are, <laughs> you know? Peggy Thompson, you wanted to jump in on this. Well, I want to agree with basically everything that Jen said. And as somebody who grew up in Florida, I'm very aware of the fact that the Latinx population is extremely diverse. And within Florida, for example, the difference between those who are Puerto Rican and those who are Cuban American um, is extremely different. And of course, the Asian population is even more diverse in some ways, if we consider South Asia, East Asia, and so on. Um, but when you talk about income, I think it's interesting. We think, okay, everybody with incomes of under $30,000 are poor, but some of them are students and are young people. And so some of the people with low incomes are not necessarily people who are people we think of as poor. And some of the people we think of as being lower middle class or working class actually make a whole lot of money. And so I think um, we need to have a more intersectional understanding of what class is, and even a more intersectional understanding of what income means for different groups. And so I guess I'm less surprised than you by um, what you found in the exit polls, but I do have a question about the exit polls. And maybe you can answer this because you're more into that than I am. And that is, 
what are the problems with doing exit polls when you have such a large mail-in electorate? How, uh, how accurate are the, are the exit polls in an election like this? I have no answer for that, but it's a really big question for me. That's a great question. I don't have an answer for it either. Um, does any, Jim has an answer for it. Jim Steinberg. No, because I mean, I'm not sure which poll you're talking about, Grant, but many of the polling outfits did a very different, they didn't do exit polls. They did a different kind of survey and they went out and surveyed people who did mail-in ballots and early voting. So this was not okay. your stand outside the poll and do an exit poll. I mean, how good it is, whether their methodology is good is something that still remains to be seen. And the cephalogists will be spending a lot of time on that. But they clearly understood that the old way of doing it, which is people exiting booths, had nothing to do with this. And they tried to devise algorithms to reach the cross section, given their projection about what percentage would come in each of these categories of mail-in, early vote in person versus day of election vote. Think so a big... Oh, go ahead, Len Berman, go ahead, please. I just think a big problem with polling now is that there's so many people who are just impossible to reach uh, because they don't answer their telephones. And uh, you know, one of the biggest problems in my field in economics is uh, trying to deal with what's called selection bias, that you have a sample and the people in the sample are systematically different from the ones who aren't. And you try to correct for it by reweighting for education and race and ethnicity and age and all those other things. But if in every group, the people who don't answer are systematically different from the ones who do, and if those differences are sensitive to current events, the polls could be really unreliable. And I think that problem is going to get worse over time. And it's not something it's not something that's got an easy fix. You can't just do a controlled experiment where you <laughs> try to figure out the characteristics of people you can never reach to collect information from. So we have had quite a number of questions um, on foreign policy come in. And so um, uh, I, I want the other three of you to, to definitely jump in when, uh, if you hear something Jim says you wanna uh, add to or take issue with, but I'll, I'll direct a couple of them to, to Jim first. So Jim Steinberg, um, one person wanted to know whether uh, one of the things that Joe Biden should do, and I guess would do, is uh, to immediately or very soon go and travel to the NATO countries and, and, and sort of re reestablish the good relations and the alliance there. Is that, is that something you see that would be tops on his list? So one of the, in my variety of life experiences, I've had the privilege of working on a number of transitions. And one of the things that's most discussed during this phase is where should the president go? What order should he go? Who should he call? Right, that'll be the other thing, not just who, where he goes, but who's he going to call first, you know, and who's he going to talk to? And, and everybody will have their own favorites and there'll be contending voices within the, the administration that's about to enter office as to how to do that. It, of course, would be really surprising if there aren't some dramatic, clear gestures by Biden early on to the traditional allies. Um, and But it's very sensitive, because where do you go over it? You call Germany first, you call the British first, you go first. I mean, it, it, and I, I, I couldn't predict, but I, I, the, the hallmark clearly will be to go back and reinforce with the, with the old and traditional friends who share our values and interests. And, and some form or another, I think you'll see a very clear signal from Biden, whether it's traveling or not. I mean, the problem with traveling is that for all the reasons that Len and others have said, is that Biden's first, second, third, fourth, fifth thing is COVID, right? I mean, we just yeah. sight of that here. And so I don't see him go around and traveling, you know, a, a lot in the early going here. I mean, there's just way too much at stake at home. Plus the travel itself is complicated and risky and all those things. So I would guess we're not gonna see a lot of early traveling, but we will see things that are kind of surrogates for traveling that reinforces the traditional allies and friends. Do any of the other three of you wanna jump in on that one or shall I go on to the next foreign policy question for Jim? I, I, I wanna just uh, interject. So I'm gonna pull it into my lane a little bit again. Okay. I mean, one, one thing that's been really mucked up in the last four years is trade policy. 
uh, we pulled out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And, and I think that actually has, that's not just trade. We basically gave an opening to China to take, take the lead in an area where, where we had been leaders. I, the thing I don't know is where Biden would end up on this because some of his policies actually sound not that much different from President Trump's. And I think trying to appeal to the people who feel like they're losing out from trade. The fact is that trade makes us richer, but we have to figure out a way to share the gains from trade more equitably. We have to figure out ways to make sure that trade benefits people all over the world. But he might engage, I mean, I, I think it's a sure bet that he'd engage on those issues uh, in a more thoughtful way than the current administration. And I think that would help. There's another, oh, go ahead, Jim, I'm sorry. Just, I mean, I, the, the problem for, for Biden here is that the Democratic Party is very divided on these issues and not very pro-trade. And so, you know, while I have a lot of substantive sympathy for Len's points, it would really surprise me given the, the lack of enthusiasm within the party. Um, I mean, it wasn't an accident that um, Secretary Clinton came out against TPP in 2016, not saying the fact that it was President Obama who had negotiated it. And, and we haven't heard a lot from Biden. So I think, I think there'll be a pause that refreshes on trade. I think that, that Biden will focus on restoring America's natural strengths to compete economically before he spends a lot of time on external things, or he'll be focusing on education and training and vocational ed and, and those kinds of things that will then he can say, well, then that once we do those things, then we'll be in a better position to talk about trade. So I think Glenn's right on the substance, but I think the politics are very complicated for uh, assuming he's president elect Biden for president elect Biden. So another question, Jim, had to do with Cuba and whether uh, you thought Biden would lift the embargo there and whether that would have some um, negative impact for Democrats with Hispanics and, and alienate some. And Peggy Thompson, growing up in Florida, may have some thoughts ab about that. But first to you, Jim, what do you, would you expect there? Well, again, you know, maybe... Uh, Vice President Biden was part of the administration that, that changed course on Cuba. So, I mean, and again, I have no idea who's going to serve in the administration, but you know, there's surely going to be a lot of people who were associated with that. So I think he will have some sympathy for that. But where that ranks on the priorities, I mean, the other thing that's going to be so important is, you know, you, you have limit. people think about what's the presidential capital and, you know, what's the, he's going to have no honeymoon. Um, he's going to not have a huge amount of capital. So the question is, where do you put your emphasis? And you know, maybe that, that this will be important to, the, to uh, President Biden. I, it's a little surprising if it would be at the top of the agenda, but I'm just, I, I would think he'd be sympathetic, but I'm just not sure it would be an early initiative. Hmm. Peggy's nodding her head. All right, so let me, let me pose another question here. And, and this is... Um, from Eduardo Miller and uh, a very interesting question on a different topic. It's, would there be impetus now? And do you think a Biden administration might be able to shepherd something on this through of some reform in anti-corruption laws or, and, and, and what, what he has in mind here is things like requiring tax returns of candidates or making it more difficult to fire inspectors general or um, the separation of a sitting president from their business enterprises. I mean, obviously Trump is the, the subject he's thinking of here, but would this be a moment to, to make some changes that could make our system both appear and, and operate uh, a, little, a little more uh, objectively, uh, rationally? Um, anybody wanna jump in on that? It is kind of a quaint that we just assumed that norms would carry the day forever. And one thing that we've learned from the last four years that is that that, that isn't the case. I, I mean, I don't know what happens in terms of legislation. My guess is that there are people on, there are people in the Republican Party as well as the Democratic Party who'd like to see more transparency about candidates uh, because they weren't that thrilled about Trump uh, beating the rest of the team anyway. And, and I think if his tax returns had been made public, he, he might not have even run. Uh, mm. 
and yeah i you know there's there's a there's a new book out by a couple of former high level uh high level justice department officials that have argued for doing exactly what you what you're talking about you know anti-corruption laws uh, trying to put in in place very very formal guide rails trying to put in place rules that would you know take would actually make the well basically what they're arguing is that the emoluments clause has no teeth so it clearly has you know it doesn't work and you could instead define the kinds of corruption that uh that are not permitted or at least require more information that would allow people to to see what's going on in real time so in my dr pangloss mode, mode i think this would be awesome and i'll let jim explain why it's impossible well, I think I think Peggy Thompson wanted to jump in on it. She's taken her mute off and looked ready to speak. So, Peggy, did you want to jump in on this? No, I mean, I think it is a very good idea. And I think um, this is a possibility because there are members of both parties who could support this. I don't think it's a top priority. I don't think it's going to happen right away. But um, it's also going to be interesting to see, and this has nothing to do with this specific question. So I'm acting like a candidate debate participant. But um, it'll be interesting to see whether Donald Trump is in fact charged with any crimes relating to these particular kinds of issues uh, once he's no longer in the White House. I mean, one, one speculation is that he will resign shortly before January 20th and have Mike Pence pardon him. But that only affects federal crimes. It doesn't affect state and local crimes. And um, so I think we've got I think there's a lot of issues relating to corruption here. I do agree that the emoluments clause has no teeth and that if some legislation could be devised that would change that, I would be thrilled. But um, most presidents are, I think, frankly, not in the same situation as Donald Trump. And so I would hate to see whatever reforms are implemented be simply a reaction to Donald Trump. I'd like it to be uh, more broadly thought mm. about and conceived. Yeah, on that, on that note, and this is, this is where I'll get some um, nasty emails probably, but I, it, it, it's my own personal opinion that, that if, if the criminal path is pursued after the president leaves office, I just think that's going to reinforce once again the polarization that all of you have been lamenting in one way or another, and and just it'll it'll create a it'll create almost a martyr effect in some ways legally, and I I, I see that as being counterproductive for everybody concerned. But you know, crimes are crimes. I understand that. Um, so can I? Yeah, Jackson. sure, Jen. Please, so Jen I think Jackson. To, yeah. to Peggy's to Peggy's point, I think um, I, I I agree. I think that um, when we talk about corruption, we have to acknowledge that that Trump's brand of disrespect of uh, the political system has been a very unique form of disrespect. Right? It's not as though we've had this long string of presidential candidates and and nominees and sitting presidents who who've done this, right? We've never had um, a sitting president who we had to fight to see their tax returns. This is not a thing. And so I think that, you know, it, it's it's not something I think that, that the next administration should invest a ton of time in um, because that in itself will also um, continue to give oxygen to the type of politics that have divided us, yes, but also centered the experiences of folks who are not invested in pushing um, democratic ideals and justice, liberation, those kind of ethical commitments forward, right? It's, you know, Donald Trump became a, a viable political candidate because of birtherism, because of his commitment to um, posting on Twitter that Barack Obama was not, was not born in the United States. And that's how he built a political following. <laughs> and so I think it's really important to acknowledge that this form of politicking, right, is it's it's not it's not something that we are typically um, used to seeing. Um, but I'm also hoping that we don't we don't then build a culture around expecting it, 
um, and that we don't build a culture around um, trying to protect ourselves from this type of culture. I'm, I'm hoping that rather than now creating all of these, all this fencing and scaffolding to prevent a future Trump, that instead we go, okay, that was really terrible. And, and these things are not what we expect to happen in um, a political system that we, uh, we trust um, to do what it's designed to do. Um, and that when I say we, I mean the American we, right? And we all know that the American political system is, is imperfect, um, but that we then move forward in a way that we can move collectively, hold our elected officials accountable rather than having to now build in all of these frameworks to say, okay, well, you've got to follow the rules, right? That's, that's kind of like not what we should have to do when we already have the rules in place, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um... I always like to have a question from left field to throw in, and it has been supplied to me by one of our state of democracy stalwarts, um, Eric Rogers, uh, and his spouse come come to all of our events, and he wants to know uh, something about the stock market. So I don't know, maybe Len, you're sort of the money man in a way. I don't know, maybe, but but what he, the question is this, and and I'll add a little bit to it. So. You know, Donald Trump talked a lot about the stock market, the stock market, your 401ks, you know, look at what I've been doing there. And, um, you know, he, he, has, he has some reason to, to uh, uh, behind him to, to say that. But during the run up to the election, when it became clear and clearer that Biden had what was thought a more sizable lead than he, than he ultimately, I guess, is going to have, uh, the stock market had a rally. And uh, on election day, it had a rally. And I was watch. I happened to be sort of watching it on election night because I was curious to see kind of how it was reacting. And it, it went down when it looked like Trump had a path and then went back up when that path narrowed. And so uh, I guess today it went down a little bit, but yesterday was a, was a real banner day. So what's up with the stock market, Len Berman? Why, why shouldn't, it, shouldn't it not like this, uh, this, this new regime coming in? What's going on? I'm glad you asked me that question because I, I understand completely everything that's happened in the stock market for the last couple of years. Uh, but I don't want to tell you because I'm going to make a fortune profiting on my deep, deep inside knowledge. Um, we'll talk later. We'll talk later. Yeah. I'm, I'm totally baffled. I mean, you know, as I said, the economy, the economy came really close to uh, <laughs> another Great Depression. And we're not out of the woods yet. We have a pandemic going on. We have, you know, all of these businesses are closed, all these people who are unemployed. And, you know, it might be that the, there's so much more concentration in, among our businesses that companies like Amazon and Google and others have so much of the market and they're doing fine that that's what matters. But, the, you know, a lot of people have pointed out the stock market isn't the economy. You know, people say the stock market doesn't like uncertainty. You know, there's a lot of uncertainty and that doesn't, I mean, the, if the market's not at a record now, it's close to it. Yeah. So uh, that's a long way of saying, I don't have a clue. Sorry. <laughs> I, I thought maybe it might have something to do with stability and that they, they, they like Donald Trump's policies on the one hand, but he's also not someone they can predict very well. And so Joe Biden is extremely predictable, it would seem. And so maybe that's what they're, that's what they're, they're, they're latching on to. Well, let me return to, uh, we, we've got about 15 minutes left, so I want to squeeze some other questions in. And let me return to another question about um, international affairs, foreign policy. We've had several on these in different ways. But, um, and, and Jim Steinberg, I'll start with you again. But how, how will the re-engagement with, with, uh, with Iran affect um, the accords there in the Middle East um, and the pursuit of peace in the Middle East. And then a more specific version of this is, will, will we also, what will be the effect on the relationship between the Sunni Arab countries and Israel um, uh, going, going down the road? And that's obviously very complicated, but if anyone can break it out for us, you can, so. Right, they are great questions and they are complicated questions. Um, I think, you know, vis-a-vis -vis Iran, um, there, you have to look at it through two different lenses. One is the specific set of issues that the United States and concerns the United States has vis-a-vis -vis Iran. But there's also the question about our relationship with the other countries that were involved in the negotiation 
of the agreement with Iran. And I think, you know, for Biden, it's going to be, the latter is going to be as important as the former, which is that um, I think Biden is likely to feel, and I'm just guessing again, that I'm just, it's all speculation, that the, the strength of dealing with Iran is dealing, is, is having a united front rather than Trump who emphasized just taking a strong stance by the United States and basically saying, I don't care what others think, we have enough leverage acting unilaterally to change Iran's behavior. And I think Biden is likely to say that the better road to influencing Iran, we don't like them, we don't like ever, anything they're doing, it's not just the nuclear thing, all these other things, which will concern Biden, but he will, is likely to think that the more effective way to deal with Iran is, is to, to gather everybody else together on a common path. And so that Biden is likely, I think, to focus on how do we get re-engaged with Europeans and the other negotiators, including Russia and China, to try to restore that united front as the best way to, to restrain uh, Iran's bad behavior. Um, more broadly on the Middle East, I mean, the Middle East is, is just changed, right? I mean, and uh, the, the issue of the Palestinians is an important moral issue. It's an important uh, issue of, of concern at a humanitarian level. But as a political issue, it's just has way, way receded in terms of its importance. Very few uh, of the other countries in the region are very focused on the Palestinian issue. Um, for the, the Sunni states, they're focused on Iran, they're focused on economics, they're focused on radicalism, they're focused on the Muslim Brotherhood. And so, you know, I think that you just have to recognize that the reality for most of the countries in the region are those issues. And right now, um, you know, there's a sense that how much credit you give Trump to is it may be debated, but that there has been kind of a tectonic shift in the way that these countries are relating to each other and to Israel that, that reflects the new agenda rather than the old agenda. And I don't think that's gonna change. I think one of the big challenges for Biden will be how to deal with the, the, the values issues in the Middle East, um, especially in light of you know, Khashoggi and, and, and other actions and how much that will continue to fit on the agenda. They were obviously not terribly important to the Trump administration, but they, I think they are likely to have some greater prominence uh, in how Biden approaches the region. Let me ask a, a more basic question that, that came to my mind while you were speaking. Um, and I wonder whether in the next four years, given that the president has so much power and control over foreign policy relative to domestic policy in the United States, that what, what will be the, will, will there, this is the way to say it, will there be an overall overarching approach toward the commitment of American armed forces around the world, you know, engaging in conflict? Uh, and, and where I'm going with this is, you've all spoken about sort of how Trump might have changed the Republican Party in a way or how it's shifting in some ways. I guess what I'm thinking is if Biden comes in and and, and, and reacts to some international crisis in a way that puts us back in a war, so to speak, um, or an actual war, would that not set the Republicans up to sort of be the party of peace in a, in a, in a strange way, given like the, the past four years, four years if something like that happens? I, I don't know if I'm making that question clear, but... I understand the question, but I think it's, it's unlikely in the Biden administration. I mean, I, I think that, I mean, Biden is, is an internationalist, but he's not an interventionist. Mm. And, you know, and, I, and I think you, know, you have to remember that Biden, if you look at his role in the Obama administration, he was very cautious about the engagement in Afghanistan. He was very uh, unenthusiastic about staying in Iraq, um, although some in the administration were pushing for more of a commitment there. Um, so I don't, you know, I mean, I think he, he's, he's certainly more of a multilateralist. He believes in working with others. He believes much more in international organizations than Trump. And that, I would, that would be stunning if that were in a hallmark of the Biden administration. But I don't see him being more interventionist or more, more likely to use force. So I don't, I don't see the scenario that you've, you've described here as a likely one, given his overall orientation about how the U.S. should engage in the world. So uh, Emmy Hallander wants to return to something that a couple of you mentioned and wants to spend more time on it. And it obviously is very important and that's climate change. 
uh, and that was certainly an important issue um, in this in this election, and certainly in the Democratic primary, it, it got a lot of um, uh, discussion. So um, let me go to Peggy Thompson first. Um, Peggy, do you do you? We're back to the question of what's possible here, but is there anything is there anything possible on climate change? Because there. The clock is ticking. I mean, you 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 know, you literally can't just say let's we'll, we'll wait four more years and see how things line up at that point. Well, I'll be Dr. Pangloss for a moment. Um, I certainly hope We're so. We're all going to take a turn. <laughs> uh, well, I don't know about Jim, but um, yes, um, I. He just did. He just did. He told us there weren't going to be any wars. That's true. That's true. I, I apologize. Okay, so I think I think that um, Biden and Harris will make some commitments to climate change. And they will do it in ways that relate to what Jim has just been talking about, which is that he's a multilateralist and he's an internationalist. And he will see this as something that requires and that he is happy about requiring international cooperation. So I do see uh, the intersection of these two issues that uh, is really, really important. And I think that uh, a, a President Biden would understand it in that way. So I don't see him taking too many actions that would be unilateral on the part of the United States. But I do see him as making this part of his foreign policy or his global policy and um, part of his international outreach. I certainly hope so, but I think it's likely. Lynn Berman or Jen Jackson, do either of two of you want to jump in? I think it's always been a hard issue. The, I mean, I, I, I agree with Peggy that uh, both Biden and Harris are going to want to do something about climate and that the base is going to ask for it. The question is how effectively he can sell it as an economic development strategy and do it in a way that doesn't freak out uh, the people who live in places that are currently dependent on fossil fuels. So actually working on the transition from our current fossil fuel based economy to one that's based more on renewables is really critical. And I know they're thinking about that. I, it's another thing I wouldn't bet a lot of money on they're being successful on, but it'll certainly be a priority. So um, we have about five minutes left and I wanna to return to the fact that, that I mentioned when we started, which is that it does look like the overwhelming likelihood is that Joe Biden will be the next president, um, but it hasn't been called by all of the organizations and some of the probabilities are up around 95%. So we've spent about 95% of our time talking about this. 5% uh, let's spend on the possibility that Donald Trump is reelected. Maybe there'll be something in these recounts, or these lawsuits, you, you know, you never know. I'm only giving you really just, you know, a line or two on this, but Let's say it is another four years uh, with Donald Trump. What would you expect policy-wise? Would you expect any big changes or what kinds of things might you see? Um, let me start Jen Jackson. Oh, let me start with Jen Jackson and then we'll, we'll go around the circle here. We'll get Peggy, we'll get Jim and we'll give Len the last word. So Jen, what, do you, what, what would you see there? Yeah, I mean, I think um, for me, I, I, I feel bad because I don't want to be a nihilist. I don't want to be um, negative, but I feel like maybe maybe um, I'm listening to Jim talk a little bit here and I'm feeling maybe more realistic, not nihilistic. Um, but I think looking forward, um, I'm, I'm more concerned at this point about how do we get the country into a place where folks can survive and thrive. And so what policies um, and agenda items can get folks to a livable state again. So folks are not in a constant state of fear and anxiety. So I don't know exactly what that looks like, right? I don't know how we get there, but I do know um, that moving forward, it's gonna take um, a lot more collaboration and coalition building um, and a lot more emphasis on um, uh, working together, even when it feels uncomfortable, right? I think that for the last four years, we've been really interested in thinking about what it means to um, uh, engage in a form of politics that, yes, like taps into identity, taps into folks' um, 
various um, kind of geographical needs. So I'm looking at the question and answer here. People are talking about rural borders and um, living in different parts of the country and things like that. And I think that's all important, but I think moving forward, like we're coming into a point where we're moving out of a, a national crisis. And so I think the next step is to figure out what it looks like to move forward together. And I actually have no idea what that looks like. I came in with uh, like a whole bunch of answers. I wrote all these great things on the page. And now I'm feeling <laughs> like I actually don't know. Um, I don't know how to get there, but I think, I think it's gonna take, um, it's gonna take a lot of local mobilizing, a lot of organizing at the local level. I'm an organizer first. And I think it's gonna take a lot of folks being participatory in their local elections, in their local politics, giving to, to local organizations that are helping vulnerable people, people who need support. Um, and I'm less concerned about national legislation right now because people are having a hard time at home. So I think that's the focus right now is what it means yeah. to like think about what's happening at home. And and Peggy Thompson, just just very briefly, you know, right. a minute a minute. What 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 would you expect to see policy wise in a second Trump term? Well, we have very little idea since he didn't talk much about policy um, during the campaign, and there's no platform, um, so we don't know. Um, but what I would like to see, in line with something that Jen said just now, is that I think there would be a lot of disappointment and disillusionment by some of those new voters and some of those people who became activated um, during this last campaign. And I would like to focus on efforts to keep them engaged, to have them not feel like all is lost just because one election might be lost. All right. Jim Steinberg, any thoughts on this question? Yes, I don't know what Trump squared looks like in all <laughs> details, but, uh, but I, I think, you know, with not that he was terribly constrained before, but without having to run for re-election again, without having any adult supervision at home, because nobody, I mean, there, there are even more never Trumpers this time, certainly in the foreign policy world and, and, and lots of other worlds. I, I just see, you know, we will see the even more of what we've seen, which is a man with, with deep kind of instinctive convictions that he will try to you know, convert and, and try to go with, you know, without any of the constraints or limits and nobody to stop him, right? And he will say, if he, were, if he were to be declared victor, after everybody predicted he was going to lose, he would see this as a vindication to, to be Trump square, Trump cubed, whatever. Well, the, la the, last irrationally, the last irrationally optimistic perspective is, that if Trump actually were reelected and it were established soon, I think the chances are higher that we get a stimulus bill over the next two months than if we have to wait, you know, because I, I think if, if he's on his way out the door, there's not much of an incentive for him to do anything. All right, well, unfortunately I have to wrap this up. There are tons more questions than we had a chance to get to. Um, I appreciate everyone that, that uh, sent one in. I want to thank everybody for uh, uh, showing up and, 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 and adding questions and listening to the conversation. I want to thank my four panelists for excellent analysis. I think we really learned a lot uh, in the last 90 minutes. So thanks to the four of you. Um, and the last thing I want to say before I say goodbye to everyone is that I want to remind you that we uh, have a State of Democracy event coming up in the spring. It's a little ways away, but it's not too early to think about it and put it on your calendar. On the 16th of April, we're going to hear from Gretchen Soren, who is the author of a book called Driving While Black, African-American Travel and the Road to Civil Rights. I've read it, it's really interesting. And she and Rick Burns made it into a documentary film that I think you can see uh, on the PBS station. Um, if you get that in whatever systems you, you have. It aired on PBS a couple of weeks ago. So um, look forward to that. And in the meantime, um, thanks for again for, for being here for this. And uh, I look forward to the next time that we can see each other virtually. And ultimately when we can chat again in the foyer of uh, Maxwell Hall after we've been in the auditorium for, for a State of Democracy event. So thank you uh, and good night.